Following World War II, the emerging Cold War between the Western powers and the Soviet Union, as well as their Warsaw Pact allies, which spanned nearly five decades, with communism and the free democracies maneuvering their assets around the world for global domination. The most top secret and challenging part of the decades-long Cold War was the game of chess played out at sea between the submarine forces of the Soviet Union and NATO. One of these super attack submarines was Russia's Kursk. How were submarines such as the Kursk a weapon feared by NATO forces? How did the Kursk event become the biggest non-combat submarine tragedy in history to date? What was Vladimir Putin's response and why did it seal the submarine crew's fate? Could any of the survivors been rescued? Hello, I'm Colin Heaton, former soldier, Marine Corps scout sniper, history professor, historian and book author. And we will answer these questions and other issues on this segment of Forgotten History. The Kursk was just one of a second generation of the fast attack Oscar submarine class, labeled Project 949 Ante, but to NATO, it was classified as the Oscar II. Designed as an anti-ship torpedo platform, but also armed with nuclear-guided missiles, it was the Russian multitasking answer to dealing with American aircraft carriers, their destroyer and cruiser escorts, and their anti-submarine aircraft defenses. Both sides built fast attack submarines to rapidly respond and engage enemy submarines or surface vessels using speed and stealth. Both sides also built larger nuclear missile platforms able to launch multiple intercontinental ballistic missiles able to strike almost any target on Earth. Many submarines built after the collapse of the Soviet Union were already on the drawing board for years. Therefore, their construction was pre-planned. This new construction period was rather tenuous due to the loss of the large budgets previously enjoyed by the former USSR. Due to the financial collapse and other projects taking priority, money for servicing and scheduled maintenance and upkeep on the ships evaporated, especially for those ships and submarines of the Northern Fleet. Construction on the Kursk started in 1992 and was completed two years later. Kursk was the last of that class of subs to be built. Built with a double hull, with the outer hull being 8.5 millimeters thick, or one-third of an inch, and the inner hull being 50 millimeters, or two inches thick, each hull was separated by two meters, or six feet, with soundproofing insulation, and the Kursk also had ten separated watertight compartments. As a result, it was considered unsinkable, and the conning tower, or sail, was reinforced for Arctic operations and breaking through thick pack ice. With a length of 154 meters, or 492 feet, and with a beam of 18 meters, or 59 feet, it was over 30 feet longer than the Oscar I class to accommodate two nuclear reactors and four torpedo tubes in the bow. Only 11 submarines of this class were built between 1985 and 1999, and some are still in service. This made the Oscar II class the largest fast attack submarines ever built, and the only submarines that were larger than their NATO counterparts, and the largest Russian submarine was the Typhoon-class nuclear attack submarines called Boomers. The Russian Navy had not performed large-scale exercises in many years since the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Northern Fleet was to embark upon the largest naval exercise in decades. The purpose was to measure the effectiveness of the Kursk and surface ships in responding to an immediate threat against a large American carrier task force. Therefore, this massive naval force embarked upon their exercise on the morning of August 12, 2000 in the Barents Sea. The naval exercise where she was lost was to see if the Kursk could fire two practice torpedoes at the cruiser Pyotr Veliki without being detected by the rest of the task force while in stealth mode. At 11.28 in the morning, the undersea explosions were felt around the world, and seismographic sensors registered the blast at a 4 plus on the Richter scale, recorded as far away as Alaska. That is the equivalent of a small earthquake. Only two minutes later from the first explosion, another even larger explosion was recorded. 
This was 250 times more powerful than the first one. The Kursk sank, and it rested on the ocean floor 353 feet down, too deep for the crew to escape, but well within reach of experienced rescue vessels. No one considered that anything was wrong until the Kursk failed to make its first communications check later that day. Due to incompetence and possibly arrogance, the naval commander contacted fleet headquarters, who in turn contacted Moscow at the naval branch in the Kremlin to report the incidents. But this took many hours. Valuable hours were lost while Putin vacationed on the Black Sea and the high-ranking officials in Moscow were thrown into a state of panic and confusion. The first rescue ships did not even arrive until almost 18 hours after the Kursk sank on August 13th. These rescue efforts failed due to the sea conditions and the lack of rescue skills and by their not having the proper deep sea recovery equipment. That arrogance culminated in the Kremlin finally relenting and taking the offers of rescue assistance, but that came four days after the catastrophe. Several nations had offered their assistance, such as Norway, France, Great Britain, and especially the United States. All had the skill and equipment to try and save any survivors among the 118 men. Norwegian divers managed to enter the Kursk on October 21st. The senselessness of the tragedy became readily apparent. The crew were all dead due to flooding or being incinerated in the two blasts. Survivors had gathered in one of the aft watertight compartments. Confirming this fact was when they found the body of the captain, Dmitry Kolesnikov. They found the note that he had written, stating that there were 23 survivors, including himself. In order to try and save face, the Russian government claimed that the Kursk was lost after colliding with a NATO submarine, which was spying on the maneuvers, and they named the USS Memphis as the culprit. They also claimed that the Memphis then retreated to Norway for secret repairs. The Russians used satellite images of a U.S. submarine in a Norwegian port on August 19th, a week after the event. This was a plausible theory since at least 11 collisions had occurred between submarines since 1967 in that area. The U.S. admitted that it had subs in the area. That was a normal patrol area, but such an event would not have been easy to hide. Later, Russian dive teams claimed to have found part of a conning tower belonging to a foreign submarine, possibly British or American. But due to the fact that it was deemed unrecoverable and not brought to the surface, Russian ships guarded the site so no foreign vessels could approach and salvage the evidence. When that story fell apart, the Russians then stated that it was also the USS Toledo based in Holy Loch, Scotland, but that story fell apart as the Toledo was in port when the explosions occurred. Besides, such an explosion would probably have sunk both vessels, not just the Kursk, or at the very least disabled any other sub that had made contact. Additional investigations led to other theories, such as the Kursk testing their new high-speed rocket-propelled torpedo, which had a speed of more than 230 miles per hour called the Squall. The theory was just that, because no one could explain how the torpedo could have exploded inside the submarine without first being armed, which only occurred after it was launched. Then it was disclosed by Russia that the Kursk did not have these torpedoes on board, although she was one of the few nuclear submarines always combat ready with a full nuclear payload. Other theories are that NATO subs, in particular Memphis and Toledo, torpedoed the Kursk to remove her as a future threat or perhaps to stop Kursk from retaliatory action after a collision with one of the American subs. But this seems the most far-fetched theory, as such an action, if proven, would have sparked a major war, perhaps even going nuclear. Experienced submariners and investigators believe that it was a malfunction of a standard torpedo that exploded and then set off a chain reaction. Older Russian torpedoes used high-test hydrogen peroxide as a catalyst for propulsion, which was deemed very unsafe decades ago and abandoned by other nations, such as Great Britain. But the Russians still used their old inventory, mostly because the nation was going bankrupt and soon to lose the economic cold war. This may be the case, as the number four torpedo hatch was found over 150 feet behind the Kursk on the sea floor, apparently blown off, supporting the failed torpedo theory. Another reason for the failure can be placed specifically upon the Russian Navy proper. Their lack of continuous maintenance and upkeep due to the high cost meant that there were far fewer inspections and corrective actions taken throughout the fleet. The final analysis would determine what happened when the Kursk was raised from the ocean floor and inspected in dry dock. Bringing up the entire submarine was ruled out, and the forward torpedo compartment was left on the ocean floor. The argument for this was because of the fact that several live torpedoes were still in the torpedo bay, hence a safety hazard. 
Yet that explanation makes no sense. Despite the fact that nuclear warheads were still intact, they could have easily and safely been removed. The reasons for the Kursk sinking are still hypothetical, but if we must select the most logical explanation, an internal explosion makes perfect sense due to the blowing out of the nose of the sub. Could the 23 survivors have been saved in time if the xenophobic Russians had immediately accepted or even requested foreign assistance? That is also debatable, but the answer is most likely no. Given the time it would have taken to get the rescue ships in place and prepare the equipment and personnel required, the mystery that surrounded the loss of the Kursk was considered solved, but an even greater mystery was why President Vladimir Putin initially rejected foreign assistance. Pride and paranoia are the only answers. The greatest tragedy was that the Russians waited too long to properly react to the situation, hence that factor condemning 23 survivors to certain death. We hope you enjoyed this segment of Forgotten History. Please click like and subscribe for free. And please stay tuned and be engaged and informed. Send us comments if you have questions or even show ideas. And we will respond to all requests and comments as soon as we can. Thank you.